Hi everybody, it's Katie, back with another episode of my vlog. And it's Sunday, so of course it's time for the Cinema Club Sunday Roundup. We started the week back last Sunday with the 1970 Chuck Jones and Abe Levitow animated classic, The Phantom Tollbooth. Based, of course, on the children's book by Norton Jester with the same name, um, this movie actually came out just a handful of years after the book came out. I guess they got on it pretty quickly. Um, and it's brought to you by kind of the same team of people that made um, How the Grinch Stole Christmas and Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. So those are two of my favorite holiday movies to watch with the kids. Um, and it was pretty cool to watch The Phantom Tollbooth and to see the hand and the styles of so many of the same people who had worked on those other movies. Um, it bears more of a resemblance to The Grinch because I think Chuck Jones is um, kind of taking the lead. The, the two of them, uh, Chuck Jones and Abe Levitow, uh, directed the movie together. But of course, with animation, um, what happens a lot of the time is one director will um, deal with one sequence and another director will deal with another sequence or one will be concerned with... Um, you know, just certain types of motion or backgrounds or whatever. And then the other one will be dealing with um, other issues within the movie. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious if you watch the movie, you can see Chuck Jones's visual stamp all over it. It really, really looks like a classic Chuck Jones, uh, Warner Brothers cartoon, or again, uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So um, The Phantom Tollbooth, if you guys have never read the book or seen the movie, it's about a kid named Milo. He's bored, he's at home, and he's just talking about how there's never anything to do, nothing exciting ever happens. And then um, I should mention the opening sequence when he's still at his home is live action. Um, and then he, he, a mysterious package appears in his living room, um, and inside the package is this phantom toll booth. And he discovers that when he gets in the car that came with the phantom toll booth and drives through the toll booth, he suddenly goes from being a live action uh, person to being animated. And there's a pretty cute little sequence where he's sort of realizing this has happened and he's going backwards and forwards through the toll booth. And you know, now he's live action, now he's animated, now he's live action, now he's animated, um, which is pretty cute. Uh, then he makes it through into this animated world and he's now in this um, fantastical kingdom populated by all kinds of strange creatures and monsters and talking animals. Um, and it is the kingdom of, um, I can't remember what the whole kingdom is called, but there's two different kind of competing lands inside of the kingdom. There's uh, the, the uh, kingdom of Digitopolis, which is all numbers, and the kingdom of Dictionopolis, which is all letters and words. Um, the book and the movie both have kind of a... Um, a very strong educational bent to them because it's like, are numbers better or are words better? Um, there's kind of a lot of learning in the story, almost too much. In fact, I'm going to say it's too much. It, both in the original book and in the movie, it comes across as just a little bit too preachy, just a little bit too overtly educational instead of just taking you along for the ride on this kind of cool adventure story. Um there's also a lot of characters in this movie, um, almost too many characters. It becomes hard to track who's who and who Milo is looking for or talking to or whatever. Um, those two criticisms aside, it's a really fun animated movie. Um, I would definitely say if you have kids who are age 10 or under, they will love this movie. It's probably going to be too boring for the older set. Um, but uh, we watched it with Jimmy. He's 10. He loved it. So, uh, the Phantom Tollbooth also, uh, had, um, voice acting by t total smash hit superstars like, uh, Mel Blanc, June Foray, uh, Hans Conried, one of my favorites plays the, uh, the king of the Dictionopolis, uh, kingdom. Uh, so anyhow, um, check it out. If vintage animation is your bag, or if you've got a little kid that you want to show this movie to, or if you're a fan of the book, apparently Norton Jester did not like the movie. He didn't like the changes that they made for the movie. Um, I honestly can't remember the book that well. Uh, I do remember the book as being better than the movie, but I'm one of those people, even though I love movies to death, if there's an interpretation from a book, I usually liked the book better. So, um, Phantom Tollbooth, uh, pretty fun, a little bit too, too preachily educational, but it's, you know, like you give it a pass. I would give this movie a B plus. Um, the next night after that, we decided to get started on our new 
Musical Mondays tradition. We are now walking away from Western Wednesdays. We are going to do one more Western Wednesday this week. It's going to be a surprise. Um, so I'm not going to tell you guys what it is, but um, we're going to kind of turn aside from doing all this heavy study of Westerns and move into musicals. And of course, we're bridging this gap uh, with Paint Your Wagon, the Western musical from last week. And this week we watched Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. It really felt like the natural follow-on to Paint Your Wagon because it also takes place in the Wild West, pioneer times. Um, and a lot of the plot has to deal with these dudes are just looking for some wives because there's not a lot of women out on the frontier. So uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, this is the absolute classic from 1954. Uh, directed by Stanley Donan, who also did Singing in the Rain. Uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers is starring Howard Keel as a backwoodsman named Adam Pontipe, who is living in Oregon in 1850, and he needs a wife because he needs some taken care of. He doesn't seem to be concerned about romantic love um, or even sex at all, um, but boy, he wants a lady who can... Uh, cook and clean and keep up with him on the farm and the chores and all of that. So he, the, the movie opens with him going down into town and just basically shopping for a wife. And he finds a young woman named Millie who uh, seems very appropriate for what he wants out of a wife. And he basically sweeps her off her feet and takes her back to his mountain cabin. And she's very excited and very um, falling in love with this man and talking about the romance they're going to have and this wonderful life they're going to have together. And then surprise, when she gets there, he's got six younger brothers and they all need taken care of. And so she's now suddenly like semi-responsible for these seven dudes. And they're like totally wild backwoodsmen. They have no table manners. There's animals in the house. They're totally filthy. They're constantly fighting. Um, they're like walking on the tables. I mean, it's like pretty outrageous when she first um, shows up. And at, at one point in the early uh, part of the movie, one of the kids, I can't remember if it was Henry or James, turned to me and was like, these guys are ridiculous. Why are they so bad? And I was like, honey, it's for contrast. So after she cleans them up later, you know, you, you get a good before and after there. Um, so the basic plot structure of the story is Millie doesn't want to have to take care of all seven brothers. And so she's going to... Um, train them and uh, help them with their manners and their cleanliness and their dating skills. It's called, you know, going courting in uh, olden times um, and try to find some wives of their own. Of course, they go to town and they fall for six young women in town, but those six young women are already promised to six of the other young men in town. So, uh oh, there's a great conflict for our plot. And our heroes, the seven brothers, who have been pretty well cleaned up by Millie, show up um, for an old-fashioned barn-raising social, kind of right in the middle of the movie. And I'm sure if you've seen this movie, you remember this scene. And I'm sure if you haven't seen this movie, you've probably seen the scene somewhere because the uh, dance slash barn-raising slash fight that occurs is um, just a spectacular piece of uh, musical choreography and acting and dancing and everything. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stone cold classic. You can't miss this one. Um, if you have no interest in musicals at all, I would still encourage you to Google Seven Brides for Seven Brothers barn raising scene and just watch that scene because it it's the piece that everybody remembers from this movie. It's the absolute just gem right in the center of the movie. Um, and of course, the kids loved it. They loved the whole thing. Um, everything except the Lonesome Polecat number, which I think a lot of people don't like. It kind of stands out weirdly in the movie. Um, but the kids absolutely loved it. They loved the songs. Jimmy was like bouncing around singing the songs after we watched the movie. Um, he really connected with the character of Gideon, who's the youngest brother in the family, who is played by Russ Tamblin, um, who, of course, is also one of the principal actors in West Side Story. So our pick for next week's Musical Monday, tomorrow, is going to be West Side Story. Uh, get a little bit more of that dance fighting in there. Get a little bit more Russ Tamblin. Uh, but I'm working on my whole list of musicals that we're going to be watching. Of course, Singing in the Rain is on there. Yes, Mom, the Music Man is on there. Um, there's a whole bunch of great ones out there. So um, hopefully you guys will continue with us on this ride of watching musicals. Um, always fun when people are just breaking out into song 
in a movie and especially in the in the barn dance scene um you have to kind of of course set aside your disbelief for a second because it appears to be a spontaneous dance but it's obviously incredibly choreograph uh, choreographed excuse me um oh the other person i should mention who is in this movie is uh young julie newmar who goes on later to play catwoman one of the three catwomen in the uh batman tv series she plays dorcas who marries the I shouldn't have said Mary's. Whoops, gave away the ending of the movie. Um, the second oldest brother in the family. Um, I will say the ending of the movie is weird. It's very abrupt and it makes no logical sense with the rest of the movie. So um, that's the downside of that movie. Um, it is the happy ending that you're hoping for, but the way they get to it right at the end is like, what? Do you not understand human biology, uh, gestation periods? And like what motivates people? I don't know. I'm not going to say what the ending is because you guys know I don't like to do that. Um, but if you've seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't seen the movie and anything I've said has piqued your curiosity, of course, I invite you to watch the movie. Um, the uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers was earlier in the week. And then on Wednesday, we picked up with our Western Wednesday catalog and we finally got to Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood's classic from 1992. Of course, he directed and produced the movie as well as starring in it. Um, I don't normally pay that much attention to Academy Awards. I don't really think they're worth that much, but I will note this movie won four Academy Awards. It won Best Picture, Best Director, Best uh, Supporting Actor for Gene Hackman, who plays the sheriff of the town, and Best Editing also. Um, apparently Eastwood was also nominated for Best Actor, but he didn't get that one. Um, but wow, four Oscars for this movie. And it is a stunner. It is such a good movie, you guys. Um, it's unbelievable. So this one, uh, early 90s, it's uh, Clint Eastwood is playing a character named William Money, who is a retired outlaw. He's become a family man, but his wife has died. He's living on a farm uh, with his two kids and a prostitute in a town nearby. I'm not sure quite how close it is for him. Um, is uh, attacked and disfigured by one of the Johns who she's sleeping with. Um, and she gets her face all cut up really badly. And the local sheriff played by Gene Hackman, uh, basically doesn't do anything to the guys who attacked her and cut her up. Um, he actually says they have to give some horses to the brothel owner to make up for the fact that they've now cost the brothel owner one of his top earning prostitutes who's not going to be able to earn any money anymore because her face is all cut up and nobody's going to want to hump her. They use the word hump a lot in this movie. They also use the word fuck a lot in this movie. They also are very, very, uh, just completely bare and totally don't gloss over what it would be like to be a prostitute in the Wild West. A lot of the Western movies that we've been watching, of course, have prostitute characters in them. Um, but the older movies, you know, it's, it's sort of talked about in hushed tones or in, uh, you know, sort of tricky language where if you're not paying that much attention, you might not actually know what's going on. Um, and if you're watching with little kids that you have not explained sex work to, um, you can probably watch a bunch of those older movies without having to explain what a whore is. Uh, but boy, Unforgiven is the one. It's just such a central plot point to the entire movie and it is dealt with in such a frank um, and just kind of honest way. You're not going to get away from having that conversation with this one. So um, if you've got little kids and you're not ready for that one, Maybe don't show them Unforgiven quite yet. Um, so anyhow, the other prostitutes who work in the brothel um, get together. They get all their money together and they put out a bounty on these guys' heads. And they say, all right, $1,000 for whoever kills these dudes who cut this lady up. Um, so this younger guy comes around and rounds up Clint Eastwood's kind of retired outlaw character and basically convinces him that he should get back in the game for this one job. Oh, where have we heard that before? It's like a heist movie, right? Just, just come out of retirement for one last job. Um, and money needs the money, but also he's doing it because it's the noble and right thing to do to defend this woman who was attacked, or I guess not to defend her, but to avenge her. Um, so he goes out and rounds up his neighbor played by Morgan Freeman. So it's like these two old cowboys who are kind of out of the game, out of the outlaw business. 
decide to get back on their horses and come back in and take care of business um, with regard to this prostitute who was attacked in the movie. Um, again, I don't want to say too much about what winds up happening, but you do have a classic Western kind of unwinding of the plot where things just kind of get worse and worse. And finally, Clint's been kind of resisting the whole time, really coming in, guns blazing, but he lets everybody have it at the end of the movie. And it's really, really, really satisfying to watch um, because at, at that point, by the time he actually comes in and just takes care of shit, um, he's got a doubly really excellent, very high moral ground, uh, motivated reason to be coming in and just kicking ass. So it's very satisfying, but it also feels almost wholesome uh, because again, he's got like a really good reason to be doing this. Um, so incredible movie, highly recommended. Again, if you've got little kids and you're not ready to have that talk, maybe wait till they're a little bit older, but man, it is a classic of the genre. Um, Clint Eastwood's a great director. It's a great actor, obviously. Um, the one kind of weird thing about this one is there is like a prologue in text on the screen and then an epilogue in text on the screen to kind of give you a little bit more exposition about William Money and the, the story. Um, it's totally unnecessary and super distracting. I wish they wouldn't have done it. It's just like, why did you add this on there? Um, People really like to wrap things up with explanations, though. I have this thing that I talk about um, sometimes where, like, the movie ends, like, five minutes too late. Like, oh, man, you had the perfect ending, and then you just kept going and explaining things, and it's, like, totally unnecessary. Unforgiven doesn't end in the wrong place, but then it has this weird tacked-on little text epilogue that just doesn't matter, but... Anyhow, uh, other than that, it's incredible. So I would give this film a solid A, A+. Plus. Great, great Western. Um, totally recommended if you're into Westerns. Uh, and then um, we wrapped up our week with a classic. Oh, I was so excited to finally dip into V, the original miniseries from 1983, written and directed by Kenneth Johnson. Of course, this is the one where the visitors come from outer space. They come to Earth, they tell everyone that they are our friends and that they're come in peace and they look like normal humans, but things are a little weird and kind of start going sideways and people start getting suspicious. And our hero, a uh, news cameraman played by Mark Singer, um, discovers that they're not humanoid at all. And spoiler alert, but they reveal this halfway through the first episode of the miniseries. Um, they're actually reptilians and they're wearing fake faces. So there are some great, great sequences where there are fights between humans and visitors and the visitor will get their face scratched and the skin rips away and they're a lizard underneath. Oh, so good. Um... I absolutely love this miniseries. I was obsessed with it when I was a kid. I taped it off of TV and watched the tape over and over and over again. Um, I was actually was showing the kids. I had to pull up the um, Adam Ant and Grace Jones Honda Scooters commercial from the 80s because, of course, I taped it off TV. And so as I was re-watching it over and over again, I watched this one Honda Scooter ad over and over again. So it's seared into my mind as part of V. Um, <laughs> maybe you don't have the same experience of it, but I had to show it to them. Um, it is an incredible, fun miniseries. So the original miniseries was only two episodes long, but each episode is like the length of a movie. And then they leave it at the end of the original two episode miniseries with kind of a, kind of a cliffhanger, kind of a downer, kind of a, oh, what's going to happen next feeling. Um, and then they followed up, um, I think one year later with V, The Final Battle, which was another miniseries um, that was three episodes long. And again, each of these episodes is like the length of a movie. So we went ahead and watched the original miniseries this week, both episodes, um, and we got queued up for this next week. The kids definitely want to watch V, The Final Battle. So um, super stoked about that, obviously. Um, we're watching the first episode of it and we're sitting there going, wow, you know, this is a hell of a Nazi allegory. I mean, you've got these aliens come in and they like look kind of like Nazis. They've got like, you know, similar to like an SS uniform. They've got big shiny black boots. They've got this logo that 
almost looks like a swastika, but not quite. Um, they've got this like uh, visitor youth organization, which is basically the Hitler youth, where they're like recruiting young humans and being like, hey, look, don't you want to be part of this cool thing with aliens? You, you can have a uniform and a blaster and everything. Oh, and their blasters totally look like Nazi Lugers. So it's it's very overtly a um, an allegory for the rise of Nazism and um, that sort of story. And Sean and I were discussing this after we watched the first episode. And then I went ahead and looked, you know, into the research um, to get ready for doing this vlog. And sure enough, wow, it's not just a Nazi allegory. It's actually based on a book written in, I want to say 1935, but I didn't write down the year. Um, book is by Sinclair Lewis, and it's an anti-fascist novel called It Can't Happen Here. So Kenneth Johnson wanted to adapt this book and kind of make a TV show that was about the potential rise of fascism in America. And he pitched it to the networks and the networks were like, this is way too cerebral. Americans aren't going to pay attention to this. There's way too much thoughtful stuff going on. And so Kenneth Johnson went away and recast the fascists as reptilian aliens and was like, how about a science fiction show? You like it now? And got to make his TV show. So it really is a anti-fascist story and th exactly what Sean and I thought it was just from watching it. Um, turns out that's the actual background of the story. Um, they have all of these things that if you watch it right now in America with what's going on in America right now, it seems um, a little spooky. Um, things like uh, they decide that the scientists are going to be a problem for them. They, the visitors, decide that the scientists are going to be a problem for them. So they start this whole um, crazy rumor about there being a conspiracy theory amongst scientists and scientists are dangerous. And so they need to go out and round up all the scientists who are promoting this scary conspiracy theory. Doesn't sound like anything I've heard recently. Um, and it very much has shades of um, what is going on right now in America. I will say that the good old boy hillbillies in V at least have the right idea. And they are on the anti-fascist side instead of partnering with the aliens. I still haven't figured out why the good old boy and Second Amendment supporters in this country are not like against the government, which is what they should be. But okay. Um, but yeah, guys, watching V now, it's a little wild to watch right now. Um, I'll just go ahead and say that it is totally awesome, holds up really well. Some of the effects, eh, whatever. Um, but, um, the storytelling, the acting and, oh, everybody's favorite, Diana, the evil bitch queen of the visitors. Whoo! She is like so impressed in my mind. I think she was like the first example of just like a totally foxy, stone cold boss bitch who's just taking care of business in like any media ever. And I was like in love with her when I was a little girl and I'm still in love with her now, even though she's like the bad guy. Everybody loves Diana, right? Right. You guys have seen this thing. Um, if you haven't, Go ahead and watch it now. I'm going to recommend it. It's pretty great. And again, like I said, it's pretty, pretty wild how it feels to watch it right now with everything that's going on politically in this country. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, something that might be pretty important is what I'm going to say. Um, but that's it. I'm going to leave it here. I've actually talked over my limit. I try to keep these things to 20 minutes. Thanks to anyone who's hung in all the way to the end on this one. That's what we watched this week. As usual, I would love to hear what you guys have watched this week, what your plans are coming up. I know we're going to be watching V the Final Battle coming up this next week because the kids love it. Yay. Um, and like I said, we're doing West Side Story uh, tomorrow for Musical Monday and a surprise on Wednesday for the very last installment of our Western Wednesdays. So I will be back in a few more days with another episode of my vlog. Until then, stay safe out there. Take care and thank you so much for watching.